So yes, the knowledge dementors, who are they? Who are dementors anyway? Well, for those of you who don't know Harry Potter or have forgotten about Harry Potter, the dementors are these creatures that suck intelligence out of anything next to them. And it makes it difficult to sort of deal with life when that happens, especially because you can't find these people because uh, they're, well, they're not people, these dementors, they're hiding under, under cloaks. So what does that have to do with psychological research? Well, I think it does when it comes to dishonesty, misinformation, lies, deception, and so on. Now, to put this into a sort of a broad 50 year context, I wanna expose you to a very brief history of lies. Now, I should perhaps apologize that I'm using American presidents to illustrate this, but as it turns out, we know a lot about American presidents. They're important all around the world. And sometimes they're a bit challenged by uh, reality and things that they have to navigate with difficulty. Let's put it that way. Now, um, <clears throat> I think we all know that Richard Nixon didn't speak the truth when the Watergate scandal unfolded. We have some suggestion that Ronald Reagan wasn't quite honest about Iran-Contra. Bill Clinton, well, no doubt he <laughs> lied about his sex life. And then it goes on and on and on. And now we have Donald Trump still for some time um, who just lies. And what is interesting here, I think, is that there has been a distinct shift over time that is very important to understand between the type of lies or deceptions that politicians used to tell us and what they're doing now. And one aspect of this is just the sheer volume of falsehoods. Now, according to the Washington Post, uh, Donald Trump made more than 22,000 false statements up through August uh, this year. So that was a few months ago. Uh, and that I think pales, I mean, everybody else pales by comparison to that. And in addition to the quantity, there's also, in my opinion, been a shift in the quality, a qualitative shift in the type of misinformation or lies that politicians have been telling. Now, I'm now using terminology that was uh, proposed by Mick Wright and Dunlap a couple of years ago, where they differentiated between what they called systemic lies and shock and chaos disinformation. And I think that is a crucial shift that has occurred during the last five to 10 years that we have to understand. Now, what do I mean by systemic lies? Well, what I mean by that is that whatever misdirection, misperception, mis, you know, deception, whatever you wanna call it, when, whenever politicians in the past have told falsehoods or spun reality beyond recognition, they did so for a purpose. I mean, the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, which didn't exist at the time, was a perfect example for that. You know, that was just a creation based on, at the very least, exaggeration, but actually, I think, willful deception uh, relating to very marginal intelligence. But the people involved in that, never denied the existence of Iraq. And Richard Nixon never denied the existence of a break-in. In all those cases, lies were carefully curated and they served a purpose and they subscribe to a knowable and common reality. Now, in differentiation to that, I would argue that for the last five to 10 years, we now see misinformation that is accompanied by complete epistemic insouciance. By that, I mean that, you know, reality no longer matters. There is no contestation for a shared reality. It is all blasting out thousands, millions of statements on social media, in the media, by Twitter, that are totally 
confusing and confused and, and often serve no apparent purpose. Quality. And um, that is sort of, I think, something that is important to realize because later on we'll see how the countermeasures to this are affected by that. Not only do lies have no apparent specific purpose in politics anymore, when they're being challenged, there's evidence that instead of rebutting the challenge, very often these protagonists just resort to ontological gerrymandering. They're basically saying, oh, well, pff, you know, truth isn't truth, as Rudy Giuliani said on national TV or they create alternative facts, or they're dismissing the idea of facts or truth or evidence. Uh, the last two people here you may not know, they're British uh, personalities that are uh, fairly well known here and have very much in common uh, with um, some American politicians. So if we assume that this is the case, and I think you know, there's, there's good enough evidence for that. Now the question is, why is this happening? And what is even more important is that it does not seem to have a political price tag. If you look at the approval ratings for Donald Trump over the time of his presidency, ignoring the final dip after he lost the election, they're pretty invariant, you know, bumps up and down a little, consistently below 50%, but nonetheless, uh, no dramatic decline, notwithstanding 21 falsehoods per day on average. And crucially, at no point in his presidency did he lose the support of more than a minority of Republicans. Three quarters of Republicans approved of his performance throughout. Now, um, I think that's a serious problem. And when I say that, I'm going back to, you know, Hannah Arendt from the 1960s and earlier, who, among others, analyzed Nazism and totalitarianism generally in the 20th century. And her conclusion was that, you know, when people lie all the time, it's not that you then start to believe the lies. Instead, you, law, you lose uh, belief in the possibility of truth. Uh, and thus our bearing in the world. And then it takes little imagination to connect that to uh, a destabilization of institutions and ultimately authoritarianism or worse. Uh, I certainly believe that that is, is a possibility and, and the writing is on the wall in countries where that epistemic insouciance has taken hold. So that's my, my sort of stage backdrop. That's what I'm concerned about. That's what I'm <clears throat> working on. That's uh, what I'm trying to explain or deal with. Now, I wanna go through three knowledge dementors. And by that, I mean the people who are performing this uh, erosion of, of truthfulness and this epistemic insouciance. I wanna focus on three different ways in which that's done. Uh, and what we might be able to do about it. The first one is, is conspiracy theories. Now, um, conspiracy theories are, you know, an extreme form of uh, shock and chaos disinformation. Uh, there's a large number of them, and um, they're surprisingly widespread. Donald Trump, just to uh, stick with his example, He's tweeted conspiratorial content about global warming, uh, something like 60 times at least. I forgot the exact number now. There's a record of this out there. And it's, it's you know, not insignificant. And, you know, he thinks it was, global warming was created by the Chinese. You know, well, I kind of doubt it. But anyway, that's, that's the sort of stuff that is out there. And it has consequences. And, and this is why we should be concerned about it, perhaps, because the mere exposure to conspiracy theories uh, decreases people's intentions to reduce their footprint or to engage in politics. Um, exposure to conspiracy theories decreases trust in government institutions and 
crucially, it decreases trust in institutions that are not actually connected to the conspiracy theory that made an allegation to begin with. So in extreme case, if I expose you to a conspiracy theory about the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you may lose trust in your local library. You know, and that sort of that transfer is a reason for concern. So I'm not prepared to dismiss conspiracy theories. But what I do want to know is to examine why people engage in that rhetoric. And my argument today is that there are two ways in which a person might come about or might come to engage in this rhetoric. Now, on the one hand, we have people that are just dispositionally prone to that. There's no question. There, there are personality variables, socio-demographic variables that are predictors, reliable predictors of people's belief in conspiracies. And once you believe in one, you tend to also believe in others. You know, so, so there is a cluster of related beliefs and attitudes that, that I think is deeply rooted in a person's psychology. But I also think that there is another route to expressing these uh, theories, and that is purely pragmatic on the basis of it being a convenient tool to get out of jail for free. And it's the second thing that I think people haven't paid too much attention to. So that's what I want to talk, talk about today. And to explain the study I'm about to report, let me first just present as a, as a fact that there is a very strong and, and replicated, robust association between worldview and the rejection of climate science. Uh, I mean, you know, there's really no doubt in my mind that it doesn't, ma it doesn't matter how you measure worldview. You know, if you express it as left versus right or liberal versus conservative or free markets versus communal approaches to the economy, it doesn't matter. There is something on the right versus on the left that changes people's belief in climate science. And what I'm showing you here are data from a cross-country analysis. And what you're seeing is uh, that certainly in the United States, uh, but also overall across 24 countries, uh, the more people, the more conservative people are, the more they deny climate change. And the effect is huge in the US and slightly less strong in, let's say, continental European countries. Um, now, that's easy to explain because the problem with climate change is not climate change, it's the solution to climate change, the mitigation because that'll interfere with business as usual. And for conservatives and libertarians, that's a very challenging realization. So what are they going to do if they're confronted with the overwhelming scientific evidence, which is justifiably rational, completely rationally perceived as a threat to, to their worldview and lifestyle? And possibly also profits, although, you know, yes, that's in there. But I think that might not even be the most important thing. Now, part of the problem with this is that, of course, if there's overwhelming evidence, then all the scientists agree. And in fact, with climate change, we know for sure that at least 97 out of 100 climate scientists, when they're polled or their literature is examined, they agree uh, on the fundamentals of the greenhouse gas effect. So. Now what? Well, uh, if virtually all scientists agree on something that's threatening me, then either I have to claim to be smarter than them, that's a hard sell, or they must be involved in a conspiracy. Bingo, I'm out of jail because I can just dismiss climate change as a hoax. Right, that's what I'm proposing is going on for some people that there is a worldview-driven deployment of conspiratorial rhetoric. Now I want to tell you briefly about a study where I showed some evidence for that. In the study, people initially gave me estimates of what they thought the scientific consensus was on three different scientific issues, HIV, climate change, vaccinations. And I just said something like, you know, out of 100 climate scientists, how many do you think that CO2 causes climate change. So I, I start with that just to get a sense of what people think. Then I 
intervene and I say, well, actually, all medical scientists agree that HIV causes AIDS and you know, climate change is caused by CO2, et cetera, et cetera. I, I present that information. And now I ask, oh, why do you think that consensus arises? And I give people a bunch of choices and they have to rate the importance of each of these choices. And as you can see, there's five of these choices that are, you know, arguably kind of conspiratorial, you know, the scientists are going after the money, they're suffering from groupthink, pursuing an agenda, and, you know, they're suppressing all those heroes that are, you know, the true Galileos that are opposing the consensus. So what I then look at is how people deploy the explanation for the consensus that I just told them about um, as a function of their political views. Now, um, I'm scoring this as conservatism for convenience, but of course I'm measuring political attitudes in, in a you know, symmetrical fashion. So it goes from liberal to conservative, um, and I'm just deciding that larger numbers mean greater conservatism. And I then look at how conservatism correlates or predicts the reasons that these people in my sample deploy to explain the scientific consensus. And I'm showing that here on this graph, which I'll walk you through because it's a little bit complicated, starting out with AIDS. Um, the gray dots are non-significant, and guess what? Yes, for AIDS, everything is gray. What does that mean? That means there's absolutely no association between politics, people's political views, and their attribution of the scientific consensus. AIDS is not politicized. Now, I'm sure this would have been different in the 1980s, but now it's not a political issue. Now look at climate change. Boom, all hell breaks loose. What we see now is we have strong positive correlations between people's conservatism and their endorsement of conspiratorial reasons for the consensus. And we have a negative correlation with what I consider to be the right answer, which is that the consensus arises out of scientists independently evaluating the evidence. The more conservative you are, the more you reject that and you favor conspiratorial rhetoric. But these are the same people who just didn't do that for AIDS. Why? Well, AIDS is not politicized. Climate change, your politics matters a great deal. And bang, you deploy conspiratorial rhetoric. Vaccinations are in between. And the in-betweenness, it turns out, is directly proportional to the extent to which conservatism predicts anti-vaccination attitudes uh, and also climate denial. It is well known that uh, the more conservative people are, the more likely they are to be anti-vax, although it's a modest correlation compared to climate change. All right, so that's my first piece of evidence. The second piece of evidence um, is again, plotting correlations, but now not with politics. Now I'm looking at uh, the correlation between dispositional conspiracism, I didn't tell you that yet, but the study included an instrument to measure that tinfoil, tinfoil hat factor, whatever you want to call it, dispositional conspiracism. And now we find um, a very interesting but very different pattern. For vaccination, all of a sudden, dispositional conspiracism matters a great deal. If you wear a tinfoil hat, metaphorically speaking, then uh, yes, you think for vaccinations, there's a conspiracy. But now look at climate change. It's hardly anything. There's a little bit, but not a lot. So everything we just observed on the previous slide was driven by politics, not people's propensity to engage in conspiracy theorizing. And again, we can, we can map this out and the extent of that divergence turns out to be proportionate to the overall correlation between uh, conspiracism and attitudes. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that, um, to my mind, my interpretation of this is that um, conspiratorial rhetoric can be deployed um, as a tool of convenience when mandated by politics. 
So you throw people in a, in a politically charged situation like climate change, and all of a sudden they're going to say it's groupthink and you know the world government and all of that type of thing. Ask them the same question about vaccinations? Nah, less so. Ask them something about AIDS? Not a hint of conservatism predicting conspiratorial endorsement. Now, I think that's kind of nice to know because it means that in many circumstances, conspiratorial rhetoric may be uh, tactical rather than dispositional. And the countermeasures in consequence may be easier than with the hardcore of conspiratorial believers. If you want to know more about this stuff, um, I published a conspiracy theory handbook about a year ago that summarizes the literature on how to deal with this stuff. And you're welcome to uh, grab it from that link. Um, and, and, you know, if you, you, can, you can have it in 12 languages by now. So uh, there's a lot of it out there. All right, moving on to the next type of knowledge dementor. Uh, I'm now turning to the media. I want to ask, how does the media handle shock and chaos, disinformation? Now, the conventional wisdom in political science, I, I hope I'm summarizing this accurate, accurately, is that the media are the principal agents of political agenda setting. And there's indeed lots of evidence for that, that you know, you can show causal effects of political agendas based on what the media report. You can show that in a number of ways. The media are clearly influential in setting the agenda. And it used to be the case that political scientists thought that the, the politicians were actually kind of lagging behind. Uh, and it was the media that, that took uh, the leading role in setting the agenda. But we've entered the different world. And Donald Trump and Twitter, uh, arguably, um, are setting the agenda, or are they? That's the question that I'm examining now. I want to tell you about a study that was triggered by this observation or this incident before Trump assumed office, which now no one remembers because there's been so much other stuff. But there was a time when he got very exercised <coughs> over a Broadway play where the cast pleaded for a united America and diverse America in the presence of Vice President-elect Pence after a performance of the stage play Hamilton. And Donald Trump got really upset about that. Uh, there, there was a large number of tweets, uh, you know, sort of launching this type of accusation against the actors. Why? Well, uh, we think, or I think, that what happened there had actually very little to do with the Broadway play. Now, what I'm showing you in this graph are Google Trends data around, the, around that time period for the search keys, Trump Hamilton. So this graph shows us how much the public uh, searched for Trump Hamilton on Google. So it's, it's interrogating Google to tell me what people are looking at. And, and guess what? There was a huge amount of interest in Trump and Hamilton on a, on a certain day that, of course, coincided with the whole tweets and everything, as you would expect. Now, what I find particularly interesting is that on the same day that this all took place, um, Trump settled the lawsuit against his Trump University for $25 million, including a $1 million penalty to the state of New York. So it wasn't exactly good news for him. You know, <laughs> paying a million dollar penalty, being a president elect, you know, might be a problem. And look at the blue line. That is the Google Trend search volume for Trump University settlement. <laughs> and you can hardly tell it happened. So the, the, the tweets, overshadowed uh, a fairly significant event at the time. Now, that just think it's a triviality, but back then it was kind of like, wow, you know, there was still some semblance of kind of thinking, gee, this guy, you know, should be accountable. Um, 
Now, is this a coincidence or does Donald Trump do this systematically? Could we say that he's throwing out these shiny objects to distract people's attention, divert attention? This is what we examined in a paper that uh, came out late last year, and I'm gonna uh, walk you through what we did there. Basic idea is this, if Donald Trump is diverting, then we should be able to pick that up statistically uh, whenever the media covers an issue that is harmful to him, he should be tweeting if he wants to divert, right? So some media coverage should evoke something with a positive coefficient in some sort of statistical model. Now, if he's really successful and the media then drops the issue, then we should also observe that statistically with a negative coefficient. Right? And that's sort of the, the, the conceptual landscape of this. Now, we operationalized this by considering coverage of Russia and Mueller, uh, which was at the time during our sampling period, the first two years of Trump's presidency. At the time, it was considered to be a major threat to his presidency. Now, we also independently operationalized what we would consider to be diversionary tweets to be those that refer to his political strengths. And we can show and argue that jobs, China, North Korea, the whole immigration cluster of terms were his political strengths that he would choose to talk about. I mean, you may remember, you know, North Korea, he was, he was all gung, gung ho over Little Rocket Man and I have a bigger button than he does. You know, that was, that, those were his strengths. And then we can operationalize our statistical models in that fashion using these uh, predefined keywords. And we looked at all coverage in the New York Times during those two years, all headlines of the ABC News, Evening News, uh, and all of his tweets. Uh, and we then did a text modeling, text analysis, statistical analysis, and related New York Times coverage to uh, initially those three keywords, China, jobs, immigration, in his tweets. So uh, first question to ask, does Donald Trump divert? Uh, these are small numbers, you can't see them. So let me add the bigger version with asterisks to indicate significance. Well, apparently, yes, because whenever the New York Times talks about it more about Russia Mueller, whenever ABC reports Russia Mueller more, or the average of the two, um, he tweets more about China, jobs, immigration, his, his political strengths. Okay, uh, does it work? Uh, well, let's find out. What we look at here is yesterday's tweets against today's coverage. This is the fact, you know, we have to capture the fact that there is a delay between a tweet and what the media can say about. It may not be overnight, but it typically is. Um, and we look at it from yesterday to today and also from today to tomorrow. It's just an arbitrary shift in the window, time window, and guess what? We get negative and significant coefficients here. In other words, the diversion works. Trump tweets about jobs, the New York Times significantly reduces coverage of Russia Mueller the next day. Oh, and by the way, we have more than 100 control variables in this analysis and control for autocorrelations and all that jazz. So, you know, this, this sticks out even after we try to get rid of it with all these control variables. But it was limited to certain keywords and not others. So what we did then was to say, well, hmm, that's a little weak. I, I, let's see if we can do better than that. And we examined the entire vocabulary, all pairs of words, except taking out the ones about the controversy itself, because that couldn't be diversion if he's tweeting about Russia Mueller. And we also now look at neutral, neutral coverage in the media for comparison. I'm going to show you a bunch of plots, and I got to explain those plots by walking you through how we did this. Now, for each pair of words in his tweets, and we know that a pair is sufficient to identify the content, there's an independent verification for that. So we take a pair, and we're trying to predict 
the number of times that particular pair of words occurs as a function of Mueller Russia coverage in the New York Times. We plot that regression coefficient, well, actually the T value, so we get significance, but you know, basically the regression coefficient. We plot that on the X axis. Uh, we then do a second regression where we take the same word pair in a tweet and see what happens to Russia Mueller coverage the next day. And we plot that on the other, on the, on the Y axis. So any word pair now has a location in this space uh, that is determined by how much it was triggered by the New York Times and how the New York Times responded to that. And if you go across the whole vocabulary, you get like a thousand points or something. I forget the exact number, but it's, it's, it's a large number. <clears throat> now, if, if there's no effect present, if nothing happens, then you should get a random blob in the middle, right? <clears throat> that means the media don't determine his tweets and he doesn't determine media coverage. Now, um, <clears throat> if Donald Trump diverts let's say, from Russia and Mueller, then we should see a whole bunch of activity to the right. Something should be triggered by Russia and Mueller and something, the point cloud should shift to the right. And if that's successful and there is suppression, then the points should also be below the zero line on uh, the y-axis because that tells us that the media is reducing their coverage as a function of these tweets. So what does this look like? Well, let me start out with a neutral term, gardening. We looked at coverage in the New York Times for gardening on the assumption that that would have nothing to do with Donald Trump's tweets, we thought. And it doesn't really. Well, except it kind of tends to put him to sleep. Uh, there's, there's less tweeting going on the more the New York Times talks about gardening. I suspect that's a weekend effect or something. Um, that wasn't me, okay. Um, so uh, there's also yet another control in there, a pseudo distribution, which I'll ignore, but you can take it from here visually that the red line on the outside here is a 95% uh, contour and anything outside that line is statistically significant as is everything uh, outside the vertical and horizontal boundaries that represent significant T values. And just to drive the point home, we looked at the economy at football, gardening, skiing, and it's all just nothing. Random blobs in the middle, as you would expect, because why would he care about skiing? And by the way, the word clouds here just illustrate what's in the articles in the New York Times that we're harvesting here. And yes, you know, it is about skiing and the Olympics and mountains and stuff. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we know from the word clouds that yes, we are actually picking coverage uh, on, on that topic rather than weirdly something else. But what about Russia and Mueller now? That's what we're interested in. What happens there? Well, this is what happens. Uh, this is the New York Times. The more they report Russia and Mueller, the more Donald Trump tweets, considerably more. And for a surprisingly large number of word pairs, there is a depression of coverage of Russia and Mueller the next day. These significant points in that quadrant were absent for gardening, skiing. They're also absent, incidentally, for Brexit which is a political topic that went on for the same amount of time, but that's not political harmful, politically harmful to Donald Trump. And here's the ABC. The ABC does the same thing. In fact, for those points, the ABC and the New York Times synchronize, their coverage becomes synchronized as a function of Donald Trump's tweets. Whereas without that intervention by Donald Trump, they're uncorrelated. And that's another very interesting finding in these data. And just to sum up what we found in, in a cartoon, what we find is that whenever the um, 
New York Times talks about Russia Mueller, which is shown by the point cloud on the left. The more they talk about it, the more Donald Trump tweets about his political strengths. Now, the words in this word cloud are the words that make up the tweets in the Southeast quadrant, the significantly diverting and suppressing tweets. Those are the words he's using to distract uh, the media. And the next day, coverage shrinks of this, this inconvenient topic. Now, the, the amount of shrinkage here is, is exaggerated. This is simply a cartoon animation of the uh, data of what we found in the data. But the bottom line is this. We interpret this to be evidence that Donald Trump is diverting media coverage, diverting attention from things that are harmful to him. And the diversion works. Uh, the media, the leading media in the country, reduce their inconvenient coverage in response to his tweets. Now, we're, we're claiming causality here with due caution because of course you know it's not an experiment it's observational data but we have sufficient circum circumstantial evidence to suggest that causality is at least a a possibility uh so politicians with twitter now have a powerful tool and can overpower media even though they're explicitly trying not to be swayed by donald trump the new york times has been quite courageous actually in its commitment to not be intimidated by Donald Trump. And yet they do this. Uh, and by the way, this isn't an isolated case. There, there, there are other instances where you look carefully, you find that media coverage is, should I be doing something about these beeps? Are they telling me something? No, that's, that, that means we are 30 minutes, 35 minutes in the talk. So we will have okay. 25 left for discussion. But it's up to you. Fine. You I, I'm not going to take too much longer. I, I did what, what other people did yesterday. I planned for that. So I'll, I'll keep going for another few minutes. OK. Um, so now we got to talk about something that that's a real problem. Everything I mentioned so far is kind of, you know, I don't worry about that too much. There are other things that do worry me, and one of them is Facebook. Now, I know everybody bashes Facebook. I don't really, but I think we do have to be, we can't be naive about what Facebook does and permits. Now, here's some brief background, which you may know already, and that is that Facebook, knowledge of Facebook likes, permits identification of one's personality. And if you have 300 likes, then you can, uh, a machine learning algorithm can predict your personality better than your own spouse. Um, with only 10 likes, the machine can do better than your work colleagues. So there's a lot of information out there that, that identifies who you are as a person. And of course, <laughs> you know, that information can be used to micro-target advertisements because, you know, all Facebook does is to sell your attention to advertisers. It's the only reason for its existence is to make money <laughs> out of your attention, effectively. Um, because if they can get you to pay attention to an ad, that's when Facebook is making money. And is it now effective to target people based on their personality? Well, here's a study that uh, was conducted a couple of years ago by Matt's and colleagues where they effectively showed that yes, micro-targeting works. And they had 3 million participants uh, presented them with cosmetic ads that were designed to appeal to introverts or extroverts. Now, having told you that, you can probably guess, you know, that's probably an extroverted ad. This is an introverted ad. The ads were presented to people who were identified on the basis of their likes as being introvert or extrovert. Um, and they were then shown one or the other ad and the question is, was that more effective? And the answer is yes. Uh, what we show here is that the introverted audience bought more stuff when presented with an introverted ad than if it was a mismatch. And the same is true for extroverted ads in the extroverted audience. So there's a 
complete crossover interaction. You match the ad to the audience, you sell stuff, you mismatch it, you sell a little less. Now, what I'm plotting here is actually conversion rate, which isn't exactly sales, but they found it for sales as well. They actually sold stuff in this experiment. And, and there is a dollar amount you can attach to this. Um, and by the way, uh, Facebook, you know, they own a, a, a patent for inferring personality for the purpose of targeted advertising. I mean, this is not anything secret. Uh, you can, I can show you the, you know, the patent is there. It's a registered uh, uh, innovation in the name of Facebook. Now, that's okay, maybe for, for lipstick or cosmetics or whatever. I'm not terribly concerned about it. Where I am concerned about micro-targeting is uh, in the political sphere. Because by definition, if you micro-target messages, uh, no one other than the recipient and the sender knows that the message exists. That means the opposing candidate cannot rebut it. And the moment you do that, you're, you're moving democracy from, you know, the public sphere into secret manipulation, basically. And that is one of the reasons, I think, why uh, Facebook is inherently problematic in a democracy as they are permitting this furtive manipulation of the population based on inferred characteristics that the very same people never consented to, to be used for political targeting. And we have data showing that the public really doesn't like that. And maybe Anastasia will talk about these data in the next talk. And here's another uh, uh, report that, uh, in fact, Anastasia was also on that, that we wrote for the European Union outlining this whole conflict between technology and democracy and all the pressure points, including micro-targeting, because the main solution to this, the ultimate solution to this has to be regulation. And that is forthcoming. Uh, I'm quite convinced of that. In fact, everybody knows it's forthcoming, uh, but it will take a few years. In the meantime, what do we do? Well, one thing we try to do in our team um, involving colleagues at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin is to reverse engineer micro-targeting by saying, okay, well, if we can't control micro-targeting, maybe at least we can teach people to realize when they're being targeted. And we did that in a very straightforward experiment. All we did in the experiment was in the experimental condition, we got people's introversion, extroversion score. Um, in the control condition, we measured some other completely irrelevant thing. We then presented them with ads. In fact, the same ads you've already seen from the Mats et al. study. And we asked people simply to, to say, hey, are you being targeted, yes or no? And we framed the whole thing by truthfully explaining to people what it means to be an extrovert or an introvert. The actual explanations were longer than this thumbnail here, and people had to actually read it. Um, we then gave them feedback about their personality score truthfully based on how they filled in the instrument earlier. And so an extrovert might get this information, hey, you're extroverted. And by the way, you're here in the distribution. There's only, you know, 24 people, uh, or sorry, 26 people who are more extroverted than you. And there's a far more who are less. Or an introvert might get this feedback. This is an extreme, he must be a mathematician. There's 98% uh, of people who are less introverted than you, only 2% are more introverted. And then people classified the ads. Is this targeted at you? That's all we asked. Um, so if you're an introvert, would you say yes? Eh, probably not. Extrovert? Yeah, probably. And here's the performance. In the control condition, People are above chance, but not, not hugely. It's actually, I mean, you know, they do okay. Um, and this is in the control condition. Remember now, we, we don't say anything about introversion, extroversion. We just give them an unrelated questionnaire and all they have to decide is whether they're targeted. Well, they sort of get it, but not that much. After personality feedback, their performance is boosted by 30%. 
at the modal response when modal accuracy is 100%. Now that's a massive effect. And the effect is um, absent um, if all we tell them is what introversion, extroversion is. But the effect emerges if they do the questionnaire and even if we don't tell them how introvert or extrovert they are. So in other words, we have now a series of three experiments where we start out with full information plus feedback and get a huge effect. We then remove the specific feedback and just let them do the questionnaire. We still get boosts, about 10%, 15%. And we then remove all of that and just tell them that introversion and extroversion, that has no effect at all. So we even have boundary conditions on this effect. But what we do know is when we do it right, then people can learn to detect advertisements that are directed at them based on their personality, well, on that personality dimension. And maybe that's a first step towards resistance against being manipulated. If people can at least tell, hey, somebody is addressing this, you know, telling me something based on my personality, maybe they can then uh, resist that. Well, that remains to be seen. Watch the space. Maybe we'll have some answers uh, on that later this year or next year. And with that, I thank you for your attention. That's what I want to cover today. I'm happy to take questions now, of course. Thank you so much, Stefan, for a fascinating talk. So that was super rich. So mm -hmm. the floor is open for questions. Please uh, add Q in the chat or question. Michael. Stephen, that was a really great talk, a big admirer of your work in general. Um, I just have a quick question uh, about knowledge dementors in the United States as they are at this exact, right, this political post-Trump presidency moment. I mean, one of the things that I think your work really, over the last couple of years, has really brought clear to people is, just as you were saying today, that... Uh, there's this systemic and in important connection between what politicians were, how they were using Twitter and news coverage and their ability to provoke this sort of cons um, tactical conspiratorial yeah. thinking. Yeah. I think that those tactic, tactical conspiratorial thinking is still going on, obviously, oh, yeah. with regard to the election, but it's no longer really Donald Trump that's the you know, the direct driver of this. In fact, it's now diffused to a, yeah. a wide variety of uh, politicians, some who have very little uh, actual Twitter profile. Mm -hmm. For example, the local state politicians in the state of Arizona, for example. Um, <laughs> who, are now, who are now chasing bamboo. In the exactly, they're chasing bamboo, exactly. And, I mean, it just gets weirder and weirder. So, you know, what I'm saying is, how do we deal with the fact when the big knowledge dementor gets broken up, yeah. right, into little knowledge dementors? How does that, what sorts of interventions, uh, what sort of things should we be trying to do, or what sort of things do, does that make you worry about? So, in other words, answer as you will, just that's a, meant to be. Yeah, a I, I think it's an excellent question. And, and um, I guess, first of all, I would, I would suggest that... Um, Breaking up the big knowledge to mentors is probably a necessary first step. Um, and, you know, Trump is really no longer setting the agenda, I don't think, except for this conspiracy about the 2020 election, which now has a life on its own. But other, other than that, I haven't actually seen too much agenda setting from Trump. It is now all done by his lieutenants. Um, but I think that's, that's uh, you know, some, the amplitude has gone down, I think, by him being removed from Twitter and Facebook. Now, how do we deal with the little knowledge to mentors? Well, part of the, the, the re well, what we have to understand is why people are susceptible to this in the first place. You know, Donald Trump should have been laughed out of town when he came down his golden escalator there and said, I'm going to be president. Uh, and he wasn't. He found traction. So why did he find traction? I think the, the, the answer to that is given by a paper I didn't have time to talk about by Oliver Hall and colleagues, where they show <clears throat> that what they call lying demagogues, of, of whom Donald Trump is one, um, 
find traction only under certain conditions. And there, there are two conditions they identify. The first condition is when people feel left behind or excluded or unfairly treated by a system, by, by a democratic system. So the people who are left behind, in, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, will accept being lied to if they think that that guy is an authentic champion of the people. And that to me explains why among Republicans, I mean, they, they, Republicans know that Donald Trump is lying. I mean, in fact, we know that from data that, that we published, we can, you know, we, we correct Republican Trump voters and tell them, well, actually, you know, he was wrong there. And they say, oh, okay, he was wrong. But it makes no difference to their voting intentions or how they feel about it. So that is one cluster of people who just don't care if, if somebody is lying. The second group of people are those who are privileged and who feel that their privileges are under threat. Uh, and in the case of Trump, those are the rich white male Americans who voted for Trump overwhelmingly because they feel threatened by women and minorities who are now claiming to, you know, who want to break through the glass ceiling. And so what you have are, are the, you know, rich white folks feeling threatened by minorities and the left behind equally white people but at the other end of the socioeconomic ladder to whom lying is okay because it's a signal of of this person's authentic championing of their cause against this mythical establishment now i think we have to understand that to do before we can think of countermeasures and one obvious countermeasure, of course, is uh, precisely what Biden is doing right now, which is to pump a trillion dollars in the economy and get people to work and give them jobs and give them something better than driving an Uber to, you know, uh, to kind of capture the left behinds and, and pull them along because you only get this happening under these social conditions. Thanks. Next question is from Kasim. Uh, thanks, that, that was great. Um, I have a question about your initial contrast between um, carefully curated lying and shock and chaos. Um, so in, in the second category of shock and chaos, it looks as though you've got the Trumpian fire hose uh, falling in that, in that category. But then as you, as you, as you brought out, um, a lot of what Trump uh, does, a lot of his, his lies seem to be um seem to have a strategic or tactical rationale i mean they serve they serve a political purpose so so in so in that sense it, it seems odd to call the shock and chaos lies as lies with no apparent specific purpose i mean they have an actual pur purpose and and indeed the purpose is 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 somewhat ap apparent as well um and just one other thing about trump um so i, th I think trump is interesting because I would I would say that that although there is there is there is this tactical element to his lying, he's also a pathological liar who yeah. lies about stuff that he doesn't really need to lie about, like the number of people at his inauguration. But even in, the case of, even in the case of those lies, um, the lies still have a function. I mean, they still, in fact, have have um, have an effect. They have consequences. Whatever what, you know, whatever his intentions. So I just wondered what, what really what to make of your initial contrast in the light of what you went on to argue. Okay, no, I think that's a very good point. Um, because yeah, I totally agree with you on, on all of this. He's a pathological liar, and that happens to to have aided him in in you know in being able to do what he's doing. So when I said the lies had no specific purpose, really what I should have said is the lies are no longer meant to convince us of anything in the real world. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, Bush and Cheney and the weapons of mass destruction, I mean, they carefully created a reality that didn't exist, but, but that was meant to be reality, right? They contested reality. Um, I don't think Trump is contesting reality because, he, he, you know, he's not, He's not lying to us to make us believe anything he says, really. Um, I, I think, as, as you noticed, you know, he, he, he just, the lies are just about him lying. It's basically a performative 
uh, aspect. And, and Trump isn't the only one. I mean, you know, the UK has a very similar uh, character uh, running the country right now, who, who is, in my opinion, equally pathological in, in his eyes. Um, and, and he is, yeah, yeah, similar but different. Uh, <coughs> so, so that's what I meant by that, having no apparent specific purpose. I meant they're not meant to convince us of a specific fact. Yeah, that, that, so that's really helpful. And that, um, I mean, that certainly addresses my, my, my concern. But then my question would be, so when Trump tweets that, you know, climate change is a Chinese conspiracy, are you uh, is, it, is it an implication of, you, of, of your view that he isn't intending thereby to convince his supporters that that is in fact the case? Yeah, I think that's right. I, 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 but yes, because 20 seconds later, he'll be on to some other story and he'll say, you know, it's an Ethiopian hoax rather than Chinese. You know, you, it's just, you know, stream of consciousness um, kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, I don't think he, he then expects his followers to believe this. Uh, I mean, the same is even true for the um, election uh, aftermath, where, um, I mean, I don't know if any of these Republicans have actually tried to make anyone believe anything specific other than, oh, the election was stolen, you know. But, but none of this, you know, like what, it was Venezuelan voting machines? I mean, did they really think that people would believe that? Has that, I mean, really? I, I don't think so. The, the intent is not to get people to believe anything specific. The intent is to undermine the official story. And, and as is any other conspiracy theory, I mean, you know, they're all incoherent. And, and the purpose is, is to undermine, not, not to replace. I think Thanks. that's the distinction I'm trying to make between undermining and replacing with an alternative. Great. Thanks very much. Great. So we have Jenny and then Oliver. Great. That was absolutely fascinating. Really, really interesting stuff. I wanted to just ask a clarificatory question about um, the two kinds of conspiracists that you discuss. Um, so the way that you presented it, it, it looks like the sort of tinfoil hat people, um, you're talking about reasons that they believe in conspiracy theorists, in conspiracy theories rather. And then the pragmatic conspiracists, it, you seem to switch to reasons for putting forward conspiracy theories, which, oh. and I wondered if that was a deliberate switch, if you take yeah. those people to not actually believe the conspiracy theories. Well, okay, there are degrees of belief. I, I think the, the tinfoil hat crowd, and let's call them that because then we know who we're talking about, you know, the dispositionally predisposed people for whom their belief has become an identity, they, they believe this stuff, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, they may not know what it is they're believing, and they, you know, but they believe something. Uh, and the others, are, I, I agree with you, that's pr precisely my shift. I think they're just pulling this end of the hat because it's convenient. I mean, the moment, if I say to somebody, oh, do you really want to fly to Bali for the weekend and you know blow all the CO2 out there? Well, an easy way to deal with that is just to say, oh, pff, climate change is a hoax, leave me alone. And, and you're off the hook, right? You can reduce your cognitive dissonance if, if you can just say, oh, well, you know, I don't have to worry about it. Uh, it's Al Gore, right? The moment you say Al Gore and you're a Republican, then you can buy an SUV and not feel guilty. So do those people really, really, really believe that uh, uh, the scientists are in on it? No, I, I, I doubt that. It's hard, to, it's hard to know, it's very hard to know, but uh, actually I want to connect this to Kasim's point about the inauguration crowd. There's a very interesting study that was done two days after the inauguration yeah. where by Lux and Schaffner. I don't know if you've seen that, but they present yeah. Republicans, you, you know the study, it's amazing. Um, you present the two photos of the inaugurations, Trump and Obama, to Republicans and highly educated Republicans will pick the wrong photo as saying it has more people in it nearly a quarter of the time. Now, that's not a mistake because you can't make that mistake. It is just not, no, you can't. 
um, because it's so obvious. Why do they do that? Well, they do it because they're they're engaging in participatory propaganda. So they say, oh yeah, that was the bigger crowd. Um, even though it wasn't, they know it wasn't. So do they believe it was the bigger crowd? Well, I don't think so. I think they were expressing their support for Donald Trump by telling those liberal experimenters, well, actually, I'm not gonna answer your question. I'm gonna tell you that I like Trump. And, and yeah. that's what's going on a hell of a lot of the time. Yeah. There's a lot of signaling happening that is dis distanced from actual belief. Do you have room for the idea that maybe the low information voters could think climate change is a hoax because people they trust have said so for pragmatic reasons? Sure, indeed. Yeah. I mean, okay. fallout is real. Yeah, that's why yeah. I'm not trivializing this. Uh, and and uh, absolutely, if people sort of believe something that they pick up and, and yes, low information voters will pick up this stuff and then say it. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, it's it's a very shallow form of belief from many people. Well, a lot of things we believe are based on testimony in that way. Maybe we have a lot of shallow beliefs, but <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. thanks a lot. Right, another question from Oliver. Okay, uh, thanks for the great talk. Well, very, very interesting points. And I'm currently working on um, on the definition or one definition of bullshit going from from Harry Frankfurt, and I was wondering um, because a lot of the things you said had had a lot to do with that like lies that are not meant to convince you about something of the, about the real world, more about the stance of the of the person uttering them, and the intent is not to get people to believe something about the real world, and it doesn't really matter what the content is. So, I was wondering if if the or one of the various definitions of bullshit would be able to or you would be able to apply them them to some of what you said yes absolutely yes and and yeah i i um i stuck with the shock and chaos uh definition simply because well because i started using it <laughs> i guess um and and um the the reason the one thing that turns me off about bullshit is that it, it seems to just tacitly reduce the strategic intent a little. Um, whereas the shock and chaos um, it at least acknowledges tacitly that that this isn't random. You know, I mean, bullshitters are are kind of like random people, you know, who randomly say stuff because it sort of somehow suits their purpose. That's my, you know, like a used car salesman who's bullshitting me about miles per gallon or something. You know, I kind of, yeah, right. you know, you can just yeah. be shock and chaos is more sinister because, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff is is at some level strategically planned. I mean, there are troll factories in Russia. We know that it's not a conspiracy theory. It's a, you know, established. We, they're, they're photos of the building. We know where it is. And we have heard from people who worked as trolls. And so that, you know, shock and chaos, the undermining is, is I think, it goes beyond the, the relatively harmless bullshit. To me, bullshit is fairly harmless, but shock and chaos has a stronger meaning. But other than that, honestly, yeah, they're very similar. Okay, thanks. Right, so I see no other questions and we're technically in the... Yeah, Oliver, do you have another questions? I, I just want to say we are technically in the break, so we'll reconvene in <laughs> 10 minutes past. But uh, if you want to carry on the discussion, and I will actually have a little point to, to, to ask if you... If you sure, go um, for it. So I'm, I'm actually, yeah, surprised by this idea that, that these people don't, don't expect their followers to believe what they're saying in respect to and, and i'm wondering if what's going on is their strategy is to create confusion to undermine the sort of the evidence mm -hmm. uh and sort of in, in more in terms of like gaslighting it's like to make them yeah basically doubt that, that they have for their beliefs it's a sort of undermining of the evidence for the first order beliefs or, or no the second order beliefs of their first order 
Exactly. I, I think, yes. I mean, gaslighting like bullshit is another term that I think is, is very near what I'm uh, talking about. Um, and again, with the, with, with the election, going back to the election and this conspiracy theory about it, uh, you know, I, I don't think they're trying to get people to believe that a, that a Venezuelan voting machine was responsible for the, for the lost election. Um, they just want people not to believe that there was a fair outcome. And so they just throw out as much confusion, as much bullshit, as much you know, shock and chaos as they can. And another illustrative case is the um, the shooting down of the Malaysian airliner, was it 370, MH370, I think, over the Ukraine, and the Russian response to that. I mean, it is, it is just stunning, the stuff they said. You know, they first said, um, Gosh, I can't remember the exact order now, but I do know that the Russians had all these things coming out from official sources in Russia. And the first one was that it was a Ukrainian Air Force jet. The second one was that everybody was already dead before they got on the plane. Then they said it was the pilot committing suicide. Then they said, I, I wrote a piece about that. Um, I can look it up if you're interested in the details. Mm. But the bottom line is they had like five or six incompatible assertions that couldn't have all been true at the same time, that they were throwing out day after day. And, and I mean, clearly they couldn't have had the intent for people to believe that because you can't believe it all at once. I mean, it's just not possible, right? I mean, how can the pilot commit suicide if everybody on board was already dead? I mean, it doesn't work. If you're dead, you can't commit suicide. So that sort of incoherence of all this stuff um, you know, either these people really have absolutely no clue and they're psychotic, which I don't think is the case, or they know exactly what they're doing and they just mm -hmm. throw it out, just, you know, undermine the official account. Right. So it's a diversion strategy in a way, drowning the, 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 the what yeah, that Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And there's, right, it's flooding and drowning. This is what Chinese censors do, for example. We know that. Uh, they, they don't, well, but they're not censors in a, in a classic sense. They, they drown out the signal that they're concerned about by uh, uh, flooding irrelevancies, even if they're true. Um, and you can show that in China with earthquakes and things where the news were bad for the Communist Party. And so they mobilized their 10 cent army these people who leave comments on social media to talk about a sex scandal and nothing else uh, from two years ago. And that was sufficient to drown out the signal because the, the real people didn't have the volume to compete with them. Yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly yeah. fascinating. Thank you so much again for a wonderful talk and lively discussion. And so we reconvene with Anastasia's talk, uh, I'm afraid, in just five for five minutes <laughs> so to keep to the schedule thanks